modern industrial plants are vast and cannot rely on manual monitoring alone to make sure everything is working well. Thus, it is common to use a variety of digital sensors to make sure all equipment in the factory is working properly. To illustrate this, in this toy example, we have a factory that has placed temperature sensors all over the place to raise an alarm if there is overheating or a fire. These sensors communicate their readings to a central server so that if, for example, there is a fire at any part of the factory, it is quickly detected and put out before the fire spreads. Now the factory is doing well and business is growing. However, the business rivals of this factory owner are not happy and they hatch a devious plan to damage the factory. They replace a couple of the temperature sensors with faulty ones that will never raise an alarm even if there's a fire. The miscreants then themselves light a couple of fires close to these faulty sensors and leave. The faulty sensors naturally stay silent and do not raise any alarm, which gives the fire a chance to spread. By the time the other genuine sensors pick up the spreading fire and raise an alarm, it might be too late. A common way to avoid such tampering is to authenticate the sensors to ensure that they are indeed the same sensors that we placed and did not get replaced or tampered. Today, we will see how machine learning was used to reveal a critical flaw in one such hardware authentication protocol that alerted researchers and potentially saved countless victims from cyber attacks. My dear friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning, and let's get started. Most of us have encountered authentication with our respective banks. It is common for a bank to ask a customer to think of a few secret questions to which only they would know the answers. These secret question answer pairs are then registered with the bank and if say the customer forgets their ATM PIN number or internet banking password, the bank lets the customer reset their PIN or password only if they are able to answer the secret questions correctly. Needless to say, we should only choose questions so that attackers are not able to guess the answers to those questions. However, even if an attacker is able to steal the answer to a question, the bank does allow the customer to discard that question and use a new question answer pair in its place. Note that it is also important that the attacker not be able to guess the answers to the new questions using the answers they have already stolen. It is interesting that something very similar is used for sensor authentication as well, except that the questions in this case look like strings of ones and zeros, and the answers are either one or zero. If an answer gets leaked or stolen, we simply discard that question and use a new one in its place. As before, it is important to ensure that the answers be unpredictable or hard to guess, and even if a few answers are stolen, then it should not be possible to guess the answers to the new replacement questions using the stolen answers. Now there are many ways to set up these question answer pairs, but many of these ways require heavy computation, which is just too much work for weak devices, for example, an IoT temperature sensor, which usually does not have very powerful microprocessors or that much memory. To get around this limitation, researchers devised an ultra lightweight mechanism for such an authentication protocol using something called PUFFs. The term PUFF is an acronym for Physically Unclonable Functions. The idea behind PUFFs is very simple. Suppose a chip manufacturing company like Intel has manufactured two chips of the same model as shown here. Even though these chips are identical in what calculations they can do, there will always be small differences in how long the two chips take to do those calculations. In this toy example, the left chip does the calculation within 0.5 milliseconds, whereas the right one does the same calculation but takes 0.55 milliseconds. That is, the left chip is faster by a tiny amount, 0.05 milliseconds. These differences arise due to minute and unavoidable variations in circuit placement and doping concentrations while manufacturing the transistors within these chips. However, technical details aside, it is very difficult almost impossible to take a chip and create a replica chip that gives exact same delays. Due to this reason, these computation delays of a chip can act as its fingerprint. To make these fingerprints harder to guess, experts came up with the idea of using switches as puffs. Switches are very simple objects. They take in two signals and something called as a select bit. If the select bit is zero, the switch simply lets the two signals pass through. However, if the select bit is 1, then the switch swaps the two signal paths. These switches are usually implemented using a pair of 
2 to 1 multiplexes but you do not need to worry about this detail unless you are interested in electrical engineering. What makes these switches unique are the delays that they introduce when passing the signals. For example, in this case, if the select bit is 0, then the upper signal is passed but after a delay of p milliseconds and the lower signal is passed after a delay of q milliseconds. Similarly, if the select bit is 1, then the signals are swapped but after a delay of r and s milliseconds in the lower and upper paths respectively. Two switches will usually have distinct delays but the delays for a switch usually stay the same over time. When we string together several such switches, we get what is called an arbiter puff. We send the same signal to both the upper and the lower path of the first switch. The select bits of these switches are the question and the answer is found out by checking whether the top signal or the bottom signal reach the finish line first. If the bottom signal reaches the finish line first, as is the case in this toy example, then the answer is 1. However, if the top signal reaches the finish line first, as is the case in this other toy example, then the answer is 0. Note that we gave these signals colors just for the sake of understanding. It does not matter if the winner signal is red or blue. Also note that having multiple switches increases the number of possible challenges and traditional wisdom from the area of cryptography tells us that this should make the system more secure. Thus, even if a few responses are stolen, we could always discard those challenges and create new challenges and there would be no way for the attacker to find the responses to the new challenges using the stolen ones. Or so we thought. However, unfortunately, this is not the case. It turns out that the arbiter puff is quite vulnerable to machine learning attacks. If an attacker steals the responses to a few thousand challenges, then an ML model can be trained to correctly predict the responses on most other challenges. What is more, increasing the challenge lengths does not offer much more security. To see how this attack works, let's take an arbiter puff with 64 switches. Let C1 to C64 denote the 64 bits of the challenge. Let TUI and TLI denote the time at which the upper and the lower signals exit the ith switch and let PI, QI, RI and SI denote the delays in the various branches of the ith switch. Note that since these are 64 different switches, their delays will in general be different too. Note that the response is 0 if the upper signal exits the 64th switch first, that is, if TU64 is smaller than TL64, otherwise the response is 1. If we analyze the second switch as an example, we notice that the times at which the upper and lower signals exit the second switch depend only on the exit times for the previous switch, the delays introduced by the second switch itself and the second bit of the challenge which acts as the select bit for the second switch. A bit of calculation gives us these two expressions for the exit times for the second switch. Pause this video and try to derive these expressions yourself. These two diagrams may help you in these derivations. To verify that these expressions are indeed correct, let's take the case when the select bit is 0. In this case, the signals go straight through and indeed the upper exit time for the second switch is simply the upper exit time for the first switch plus P2 and the lower exit time for the second switch is the lower exit time for the first switch plus Q2 just as predicted by these expressions. You can verify that the expressions also check out for the case when the select bit is 1. To avoid getting confused with so many symbols, let us define some shorthands. Let delta i denote the lag between the upper and lower exit time for the ith switch. Note that the response is 0 if delta 64 is less than 0 since that is exactly when the upper signal reaches the finish line before the lower signal. A little bit of simple math and defining some more shorthands tells us that delta 2, the lag after the second switch, can be defined in terms of the lag after the first switch, that is delta 1, and these newly defined quantities di, alpha i and beta i. Note that di is simply the second bit of the challenge re-encoded as minus 1 or plus 1 instead of 0 and 1, and alpha i, beta i are terms that depend only on the delays introduced by the second switch itself. The relation we just derived between delta 2 and delta 1 actually holds everywhere and allows us to write delta i in terms of delta i minus 1. Now, since the same signal was sent to the first switch, we can safely assume that delta 0 is 0. Here on, we can use the expression we derived above to first calculate delta 1, then delta 2, and so on. By the time we reach the expression for delta 4, we start to see a pattern emerging. 
It seems that delta 4 is a sum of a lot of terms, where each term is a product of two quantities. One that depends only on the re-encoded challenge bits and the other that depends only on the delay parameters of the switches. Going on this way, we can come up with an expression for delta 64 as well. If we clean up that expression, we find that the final delay delta 64, the one that decides the response, is nothing but an expression of the form w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 all the way till w64 times x64 plus b, where these xi's are just numbers that can be obtained by multiplying successive re-encoded bits of the challenge and both b and wi's can be found out from the delay parameters of the switches. We need only stare at this new expression for a moment to realize that this is nothing but a linear model hiding in plain sight. Let us take a moment to understand what this means. What we have just derived is a mathematical proof of the fact that despite all the complications put in while designing an arbiter puff, its responses can be predicted by some unknown linear model. This linear model is unknown since we do not know the delay parameters pi, qi, ri, si of the various switches in the puff. But now comes the question we were all dreading all this while. Is it possible for an attacker to find out what is this unknown linear model by stealing a few challenge response pairs? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. So here is a recipe for cracking an arbiter puff. First, the attacker steals enough challenge response pairs. For a 64-bit arbiter puff, a few thousand challenge response pairs are usually sufficient. Recall that the total number of possible challenges is 2 to the power 64, which is in the quintillion, so a few thousand challenge response pairs is hardly anything. Then, the attacker re-encodes each stolen challenge as a 64-dimensional feature vector xj by re-encoding each bit and then taking these cumulative products. Note that every coordinate of xj is either minus 1 or plus 1. The attacker also re-encodes the corresponding stolen response as yj, which is also either minus 1 or plus 1. Then the attacker uses some machine learning technique to learn a linear model that is good at predicting yj from xj. Note that this is simply a binary classification problem since yj takes only two values, minus 1 and plus 1, and there are tons of ways to solve this problem which we will learn in future discussions. Once this is done, even if the stolen challenge response pairs are removed and fresh challenges are introduced for the same puff, we can easily predict those responses by applying the linear model. Once this revelation was made to the hardware security community, people stopped using arbiter puffs for authentication and putting a lot of effort to design better puffs that cannot be broken so easily. The case study we just saw teaches us several important lessons about how machine learning is used in the real world. We saw how machine learning was used to alert the cybersecurity community about the vulnerability of the arbiter puff and it prompted researchers to invest time and effort into developing stronger puffs that do not crack under machine learning attacks so easily. The Ising puff, the LP puff are among recent examples of such puffs and links to their respective publications are listed below in case you are interested. Machine learning has similarly been used to make advances in several other fields such as medicine, healthcare and governance. This case study also taught us that before we can apply machine learning algorithms, we need an in-depth understanding of the application we are trying to solve. For the arbiter puff case, it is only because we did all the hard work to painstakingly analyze the delays and the exit times that we could figure out that a linear model could crack that puff. But perhaps most importantly, this case study taught us the importance of using good features when using machine learning models. Note that a linear model applied to the original challenge vector CJ with all the zeros and ones, would not have been able to predict the response. It is only when we re-encoded each bit and then took the cumulative products of those re-encoded bits to create the new, more informative feature vector xj that a linear model was able to predict the response. In this case, it was a coincidence that the original features cj and the new features xj were both 64-dimensional. Usually, this may not be the case. Finding the most informative features is one of the key steps to successfully applying ML to solve a given problem. In fact, being able to automatically discover informative features can be seen as one of the biggest achievements of deep learning. With all these lessons in mind, it is time to wrap up this discussion. I would like to give a huge shout out to the Settlor team who made this case study possible. The Secure Embedded and Smart Things Laboratory is doing some super exciting work in applying machine learning to various aspects of hardware security and you should totally check out their recent projects on their lab homepage. As always, 
Don't forget to stay fantastic and I will catch up with you next time.